Good morning and Merry Christmas. So today is actually the Feast of Stephen, the 26th of December. Yesterday morning I was throwing up early on and so has been most of my family, um, all seven of us, over the last 48 hours or so. So it's been quite the, uh, quite the Christmas, to say the least. But in spite of the overwhelming circumstances and the change of plans, um, and it's obviously God does give us more than we can handle, but as Paul says, we receive the sentence of death so that we, re we rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So uh, this video is, is about Christmas and the incarnation, not about uh, the hard circumstances I've just come through, but uh, if you're wondering why this is a day late, that is why. <laughs> so... Um, at Christmas, we celebrate the incarnation of our Lord, right? The blessed nativity, the birth of Jesus. And it's just incredible. It's, it's so worth celebrating, right? In spite of all the circumstances of our lives, our, our culture wants us to hope in having a merry little Christmas and having the perfect ending to the perfect day and all the, the cultural phenomena that go along with this time of year, like sleigh bells and fires and all that kind of stuff. And that's all good, right? All the, the traditions, the Christmas cookies and the parades and the tree and all of that is, is worth celebrating, right? It's, it's not a bad thing to, to embrace the, the joy of the season and to do all of that. But, you know, like what I experienced was working a lot of hours for the Postal Service and then having some couple days off here and getting sick and having sick family members and cleaning up vomit okay so that's not a merry little christmas the way that uh, the songs sing and the way that i was hoping for however the facts the objective historical facts of the incarnation do not change right for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven was incarnate from the holy spirit and the virgin mary and was made man All right that's from the nicene creed so the objective historical truth of God incarnate, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ born of the Virgin, this, does, this is true, right? This is objective historical fact. And it's not just out there somewhere. It's for us and for our salvation. So it's worth celebrating. We have a reason, an objective reason to give thanks, an objective reason to have hope. Because though we were without God and without hope in the world, God in Christ has come into the world to reconcile us to the Father. God in Christ has come into the world to save sinners, as St. Paul says, of whom I am the foremost. So there's good news, no matter how wicked, no matter how weak, no matter how broken your Christmas might have been, there is good news, right? What we celebrate as Christmas is the dawn of redeeming grace. And sadly, in the church today, there's been a lot of Trinitarian revisionism. People have been kind of toying with the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, there's not a faithfulness to the creeds. Modern evangelicalism uh, has a borderline heretical approach to the Trinity. And I'm thinking specifically of the eternal subordination of the Son heresy and doctrines like that where people have tried to read human relationships back into the triune God, which is, a, which is bad. It's not, not a good. So all that to say, right, if we get the Trinity wrong, we get Christianity wrong. And, and along with the Trinity is the Incarnation. So the creed that's become exceedingly precious to me is the Athanasian Creed. Because the first part of the Athanasian Creed is rightly believing the Trinity, right? Rightly articulating the Trinity. And the second part is rightly articulating the Incarnation. So we need to get the Trinity right so that we get the identity of God right. Then we need to get the Incarnation right so that we get the identity of Christ right. And it's, you know, it's for us and for our salvation, right? If Jesus Christ isn't who he is and hasn't done what he's done for us, then we're not saved. We're still without God and without hope in the world. We're still far off and dead in our sins. So the foundation of our hope in Christ is 
in the truth of who he is and what he's done. And the Athanasian Creed, with its proper articulation of the Trinity and the Incarnation, protects and encapsulates that glorious truth for us. Right? Later reform confessions build on the Catholic creeds. They affirm the creeds as being rightly Catholic, as being true, as being the doctrine of the church, um, and as being the proper articulation of the Trinity and the Incarnation. We receive, as the 39 Articles says, we receive those creeds commonly called Catholic, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. So it's in, extremely important, right? Protestants historically have affirmed the creeds. We are creedal. And um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the Trinity uh, in this video, but that is an extremely important foundational doctrine to Christianity, right? Sects that go astray and deny the Trinity are not Christian. Because in their scheme, ultimately, God is not who he is. Jesus, they get Jesus wrong, so Jesus isn't who he is. And the Jesus they have invented is not the Jesus of Scripture who saves. So from the second part of the Athanasian Creed, we read, It is necessary to everlasting salvation that he also believe rightly the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the right faith is this, that we believe and confess, that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man. God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the worlds, and man of the substance of his mother, born in the world, perfect God and perfect man, of a reasonable soul and flesh subsisting, equal to the Father as touching his Godhead, and inferior to the Father as touching his manhood. So that's the, just to go back to touch on ESS again and all the forms of ESS in the modern church. That's the fundamental error, right? Christ is only inferior to the Father, subordinate to the Father in his in incarnation, in his humanity. He's equal as touching his Godhead. Christ is fully God and fully man. He's the second person of God. They're co-equal, co-eternal, right? Their, their glory and majesty is one. There's one divine nature. There's one divine will. There's one God who eternally exists in three persons. And it's a mystery, but we confess the Trinity in unity and the unity in Trinity, and we don't mess that up. Okay, so he is equal to the Father's touching his godhood and inferior to the Father's touching his manhood, who, although he be God and man, yet he is not two, but one Christ, one not by the conversion of the Godhead into flesh, but by taking of the manhood into God, one altogether not by confusion of substance, but by the unity of person. For as the reasonable soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, who descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead. He ascendeth into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty. So the one Christ they're not two persons in Christ. There are two natures in Christ. He's one person in two natures, right? That is, that is mysterious and not able to fully be grasped. But he must be one person. He is one. There's one who. But there are two natures, God and man. And he must be true God and true man, fully God, fully man, perfect God, perfect man. Or our salvation doesn't happen. He must be God so that he can satisfy divine justice. Yet he must be true man so that he can actually represent us as the last Adam and pay our debt in our place on the cross. So for us and for our salvation, he was he came down from heaven, was conceived of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and made man. Right? He was he was born into the world, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law. He had to be made like his brothers in every way except sin so that he could be a faithful high priest and an adequate mediator and redeemer. So the identity of Jesus is absolutely crucial 
to the Christian faith. But if the second person of the Godhead is inferior to the Father in any way in the Trinity, then we don't have Christianity any longer because he's not fully God. Christ is worthy to be worshipped, and we do worship him. The church has always worshipped, glorified, and adored the Son, along with the Father and the Spirit. Right? We say that the Spirit is worshipped and glorified along with the Father and the Son in the Nicene Creed. All three persons of the Trinity are God. And so we worship Christ as Lord and God, because he is. But he also is man, born into the world of the same substance as us, because he received his humanity from his mother. That's another error that you will find in those ESS camps is that because they read the subordination back into the Trinity, they will all, they will then put that onto human relationships, male-female relationships, and some of them even claim that females, women, are ontologically different than men. Okay, that's a that's that's a very dangerous and damaging claim to make. Women are of the same nature as man. Men and women are equally the image bearers of God. So much so that in Christ there is neither male nor female, slave nor free, right? Jew nor Gentile. These divisions don't count when it comes to being in Christ. Now that doesn't mean that there should be gender confusion, or that gender distinctions are completely irrelevant. But what it does mean is that ontologically there is one human nature, and that the image of God is manifest as male and female. So, and here's the thing, right? If women are inferior, then how did Christ receive his true human nature from his mother? Which is what we confess in the Creed. As I just read, right, of the, he is man of the substance of his mother born into the world. So he received his flesh from his mother. He's true man because Mary bore God. I've made another video about that elsewhere. How it is proper and appropriate to call Mary the mother of God because that is a, actually a Christological affirmation. Right? Because the one who Mary bore is God. He's God and man. And that's what we're discussing here today in the Incarnation. Jesus Christ, perfect God, perfect man. So women are not inferior to men. They are equal, both by creation as equally image of God, and also in redemption. They are equally, in Christ, co-heirs together of eternal life. And that male-female distinction is overcome, in some sense, in Christ. That's what St. Paul plainly teaches. There is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek. There, we are all one new man in Christ. So there's this new humanity that transcends some of these other categories. It doesn't erase them. It doesn't make them irrelevant. But it, it does relativize them in an ultimate way. So as we celebrate the incarnation, right, I just, I urge you to know your creeds, to embrace the creeds, even if you start reading them and you're like, man, this is kind of confusing. It's hard to understand. Yes, it's mysterious. It is the great mysteries of our faith. But the creeds are guide rails, right? these guardrails that protect us from heresy. The early church had to kind of hammer out the truth of who Jesus is in the midst of great controversy in the church. Right, Athanasius against the world. This creed is named for Athanasius. It wasn't probably written by him. As far as we know, it was written in Gaul, which later became modern-day France. But it summarizes Athanasius' teaching. Right, He was a bishop in Alexandria, uh, he was important 
in the uh, early controversies against Arianism. He wrote the book On the Incarnation, which I highly recommend. So the reason they call this the Athanasian Creed is because they're saying, hey, this creed summarizes the proper doctrine of God and Christ that Athanasius defended, right? He was in exile multiple times. Arianism was very popular in the ancient church. And of course, Arianism says there was a time when the sun was not, and they denied that Christ is true God, fully God, of the same substance as the Father, co-equal in glory. And that is highly erroneous and problematic, right? Arians today, most prevalent Arianism in America today, or in the world today, is Jehovah's Witnesses, who have basically affirmed the same basic heresy that Jesus Christ is not God, Jehovah's God, and Jesus Christ is basically the highest creature. Hey, but the highest creature cannot satisfy divine justice for us as Jesus Christ has. So we must be orthodox when it comes to the Trinity and the Incarnation. So if you've been confused or uh, damaged by the errors that are rampant in the American church today, um, right, all the ESS teaching, whether it's their teaching on the Trinity that's so terrible or their doctrine of the image of God and male and female relationships, um, I just want to liberate you from that and say, go to the creeds, know your creeds, memorize the creeds. They're gifts that just keep giving. You just go deeper into them. The goodness, the rightness of their doctrine, the truthfulness of it, it, it just, it's like a telescope that just magnifies the glory of Christ for us. So I just wanted to get on here and encourage you that no matter what your circumstances are or have been, your hope is rooted in God who took on flesh and dwelled among us. Your hope, our hope is in Christ for us, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and made man. And he suffered for our salvation. He overcame death and the grave for us. He is our mediator who brings us back to God. So I just wanted to wish you a Merry Christmas. And may you and your family experience the joy that comes, only comes, from having your hope anchored in Jesus, our Redeemer, and our God-man. Merry Christmas and God bless.